We're very pleased to present this program, which is the first in a series that we're doing throughout the run of this exhibition. So if you grab a brochure on the second lunch page, you'll see all the programs listed. We're very lucky to have, I'd say, about 20 or 25 of the artists in the show uh, participating um, over the next couple of months in a free public talk um, to talk about their work and about this project and what it means to them. Imago Mundi is the Latin expression of image of the world. So as such, it is a global map in the making of human cultures that was organized and conceived actually by Luciano Benetton, the co-founder of the leading fashion brand. During the past 10 years, 25,000 artists from more than 150 countries have participated worldwide. My main goal was to show Central and Eastern Canada as a cultural laboratory, a think tank of ideas, a crucible of experimentation. So I chose to expand the range of disciplines to showcase Besides painting, sculpture, and photography, I thought, <clears throat> why not include architecture? Why not design, as well as literature, cinema, and music? So I thought as well that it was fundamental to promote young emerging artists along with established ones in an intergenerational approach. Therefore, the age of the artists selected range from 25 to 93. From the outset, architect Tobias Carpa designed the Imago Mundi installation that you can see. The grid is very powerful. It underlines at once the similarity and the diversity of the artworks. And the result is a democratic, collective, multidisciplinary portrait of Canada in its vastness and its, in its cultural complexity. I couldn't help be struck, but be struck by the democratic format of it. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are. If you, you're, you're Michael Snow or you're Miles Gertler, you get the same 10 by 12 centimeter square. Um, and I think that there's something really sort of, um, I would describe it as liberating. You're bringing together a number of artists who would never have been seen together before. And I think that's a great thing. It's, it's going to be interesting to see, see them compared to each other. Yes. You're sitting at a table here with people who have remarkable long-ranging careers, epic subjects, enormous installation work, all kinds of institutional representation, um, and they're doing 10 by 12 squares. And I'm interested to hear, and this is an open question, and I hope that we can have a conversation about it, just formally, um, what it's like to sort of work with no parameters versus working with incredibly strict parameters that, that you have to meet. Um, and I'd like to start, maybe, maybe we can start with you, Vera, if that's OK. Because I mean, nobody, nobody crafts an epic like you do, <laughs> in my mind. Number one, Francesca is absolutely persuasive when she wants <laughs> <laughs> I think many of us would agree with that, yeah. too. Yes. <laughs> if she just brought me a one centimeter cube, <laughs> I would probably have had to find a way. But what she didn't know was that giving me this fed into one of my ongoing fantasies. Whenever my work gets difficult, which is frequently, my fantasy is that I'm going to take up watercolors and help them. <laughs> <laughs> and I've threatened it more than once, and I thought, ah, this will be my passport. <laughs> If I manage this, then I don't have to do any more interdisciplinary stuff. I don't have to write anything. I just take out my watercolors. I can dedicate it to Francesca, but it can be a serene and calm life. So that's what you have in that particular painting is evidence of one of my ongoing fantasies. If I can do this, then I'm a free agent. <laughs> This tiny format for you was, was very liberating. Yes. Which is, which is interesting. Because it was comforting to have a limitation. Right, exactly. Because most of my work has no limitation. Right, exactly. And it tends to grow of its own accord. Mm -hmm. And I follow. But here I could think I was leading. 
<laughs> Going back cultural uh, laboratory, well, I thought about it a lot and uh, had got nowhere. But then what I wanted to say about, about that topic or about that title is, well, the only cultural uh, 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 laboratory that I know is that I was taken away from my parents when I was about six years old uh, to go to a sanatorium because I had tuberculosis and I just lost it. And then I came home after six months and then I was taken away again to put in residential school for the next 12 years. And I almost lost my language. I almost lost my tradition. So there was, it was a catastrophe. There was just a cultural mess, but survived. And I had an opportunity to address Central Canada about, you know, one of, the, one of the most wonderful things growing up and learning to be a hunter as well were uh, the deer, jumper we call them in Manitoba. Mm -hmm. And I've had this Pashkwagen, uh, we call it, this hide, uh, for many years, my mother had given it to me, and she wrapped the uh, medicine on it. And eventually, I, I, it was a large piece, about this big, about twice the size of that. And I made two leggings out of that. The iconography is interesting, because I thought that was a cross, because you it went is, uh, to the is, Vatican. Yeah. Instead, it's a star. It's a morning star. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very special symbol for us. You, you see this in the morning and our parents used to take us on Easter to see the, uh, the sunrise but before the sun came up on, on the horizon Lake Manitoba then we would see the morning star and then it would travel it would disappear during the day and we would see it again at the end of the day so it's a very it's a very important symbol. What I'd like to do is take ownership of some of the, the deeds of purchase, um, the treaties, uh, the, um, uh, the laws that have been enacted that have uh, transferred the land here in Canada uh, from Indigenous people into the Crown. Because this is an international show, I was very interested in the Royal Proclamation, which is um, not a domestic uh, treaty, it is an uh, international treaty. So I, um, I wrote out the Royal Proclamation and cut out a little piece of it and attached it to this small uh, scale um, canvas. And then <clears throat> I wanted to pierce that document. And so often um, my practice is about um, stabbing or, or drawing um, threads or beads through those documents of occupation and control. And it is a way to, uh, uh, to make them my own or to uh, puncture them in some way. So I beaded um, a small effigy of a crane. And in, um, in Anishinaabe tradition, at least in, in my community, the crane um, people, the crane clan, are the chiefs. Typically, this would be the people who would be um, nominated to be uh, the leaders. And so I wanted to draw a connection between leadership and this proclamation. It was essentially the king drew a line on a map and said, all right, then this is for you, and this is for you. And I found that this action of drawing a line on a map and proclaiming who will live where has been a, uh, an act of oppression across nations for hundreds of years, and I wanted to talk about that. Yes, it, these small pieces are fantastic because, uh, you know, uh, I would like actually to express my gratitude because all of you didn't just make a little doodle, but you really gave the quintessence of your art. So I'm very, very thankful. Because, uh, because there is really your art in miniature. And, uh, and therefore, it is a real business card of what you are able to do. 
Graham is the youngest artist of this group, and yet highly experimental and innovative. You managed to create a form of animation without any use of technology. The starling flies in and out of the canvas. It's almost a magic trick of an illusionist. So since we are surrounded by 750 10 by 12 centimeter artworks, let me ask you, what was it like working on such a micro dimension? Uh, well, I, I do work in nature uh, quite often, so working small is not outside of my range or level of experience, but uh, working from a canvas is it's, it's something I did by the do quite long ago. Um, in terms of a, a starting place. Uh, but at the time, I was working on um, works, kind of an obsession with uh, urban wildlife and, and kind of the environment that they, they're, they're tied to and that we've created. Um, and the starling was an animal that uh, I was quite obsessed with. I still am. I've worked on several projects involving starlings. So the starling itself was the exact same size as this canvas in a sense, and uh, in physically. And um, so when I saw the size of the canvas, it was kind of an instant, um, instant idea that I uh, was excited about. So let's move now to Nicola Feldman Kiss. Can you please comment the 3D? printed work you have done for Imago Mundi. So what I did is I had a skull, a human skull scanned, and then I modeled that skull in 3D software to fit it over top of the canvas. And what I was really interested in was having the canvas look back at us and, um, and, and having the body be, be part of the artwork. It was an interesting challenge for me because I don't typically work with a with canvas in, 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 in particular, because um, yeah, I, I don't do painting generally. But so. you do large photographs as well, no? Yeah, I do. I work across disciplines, and I tend to, you know, to start with some idea that I have, which is not always easily um, uh, fabricated or manufactured, and then I then I sort of rise to the challenge of that and. Um, so yeah, so this piece is sort of between the child of op childish objects work, the camera eye, and um, and other works that I have done sub subsequent to that, including the work that's on the Sidley Hall right now, which is a collection of portraits of young men cradling a set of human bones. Jelly, would you like to talk a little bit about yours? I mean, you've you've also worked in like large installation scale. I mean, you've worked with with technology, you've worked with language, you've worked with all these different things. Um, and you've chosen this, what appears to be sort of like almost like a, a rune-like form. Actually, I'm really interested in the idea of the fragment okay. and narration through that fragment. And uh, so one of the things that was really important to me was um, this possibility that there would be so many different traditions that would be present. So that little clay hand, it came from a kind of souvenir from my uh, family's country, origins, Syria, Lebanon. And um, so it's a protective hand with a little eye. Um, and it kind of crosses over within many different traditional traditions and, and notions of protection. So I wanted to uh, bring that particular little fragment, which had been part of a larger installation, into the, into the piece. Um, this kind of notion that we could tell a narrative, we could tell a story from a little piece of something. Um, that kind of archaeological reference um, that the fragment carries. Um, just briefly what that piece is that Kim Tomczak and I made is a still from a video that we made um, over a year-long period. We visited one intersection in every one of the 140 official neighborhoods of Toronto and we got that from the City of Toronto website and we would go to a map and uh, put the finger down and say, okay, that's our intersection. We would drive there and we would photograph uh, the street signs of each of those. Uh, we would videotape the street sign of that intersection. And then we made a 31-minute video that was later shown at TIFF. 
and people watched it, which is unbelievable to me. <laughs> uh, it's a, uh, and we're, it's, a, it's mesmerizing, uh, it's mesmerizingly um, ordinary, uh, but it speaks of the city, and I think that's the reason we selected that work to put on the um, small canvas. We don't work on canvas, so. But Kim used to be a painter, so he was able to get the canvas off and <laughs> print on it and then put it back on, so. But I think to speak about the, the, the word that you used, uh, Murray, around democracy, the, the democratic nature of being uh, confined to this, uh, the same size so that no one's bigger than anyone else um, is remarkable, like how much work that people put into these tiny, um, what to me is Microcosm. Well, it is a microcosm, but then when you put it all together, it's much more than that. It's, um, you can see some people's style and signature, and you can't guess other people's. You really can't. Like there's, um, it's nice that the, that the names are so small because you have to kind of move in to see who's that one. So you see this incredible palette, and you can also turn the artwork when you see these two clasps, it means that it is double. So you are allowed to do as if this was a book. This is a sort of an imaginary library. Our informal conversation that we entitled the intergenerational path because we thought that it is fundamental to promote young emerging artists along with established ones. So, my first question is for, for you, Erin. I know that you traveled a lot to Italy, you went to Florence, you studied there, you went to Venice, but I'd like to know whether uh, Imago Mundi gave you some new artistic possibilities and whether your trip to Venice has left a mark when you came <laughs> and saw for the first time Great and North at Palazzo Loredan. I went to Venice with the sort of hopes of connecting with other people and other artists in unexpected ways um, allowed me to just gravitate towards this exhibition on my own. Unbelievable. Which is so fascinating. And later that evening was when I ran into Peter Milligan, who's, a, who's generously supporting Amanda Mundi, um, and we became friends. And we traveled around Venice together and experienced the Biennale together. And, um, discovered more about our own practices and who we are as people and connected in a way that sort of te it seemed to bridge any sort of generational gaps and so to me that's really what that's the sort of feeling that I that I sort of that resonates with me about this this entire exhibition and I'll talk a little bit about um, the fact that my recent work has been introducing um, constraint and limitations in a way that I've never explored before. Um, the small this, format. This, the small format and that was a challenge. Exactly, and so it's a it's a uniform and a universal format that every artist had to work with, and they found ways to break their own barriers. For Gita to impulse as your career. Um, moves along is to get bigger and bigger, to approach you know, more of the architectural scale, to, to build, but also at the same time so much of your training is really one uh, as an image maker. So um, sort of following from Mies van der Rohe's tradition of um, taking uh, large uh, zoomed in images of marble grain, of wood grain, the, the funny thing is in my images I scale up my material samples as well. And then the image that I made here, I originally produced for a larger print, but I never printed it, I never exhibited it. And so then it's so small, it started to scale down, and then I realized that the material was back at the actual the initial size. That, that was probably That's that so initial. exciting. With respect to scale and the, the three printing technology that I was working with for this specific project, um, it was, it's really easy to scale. All you have to do is digitally say, okay, I'm doing a four foot tall sculpture or I'm doing a, a, a four inch tall sculpture. One of the things that I, I really loved about Amago Mundi was 
the context that, that I sort of found this in because I, I looked at 3D printing like this really cutting edge frontier technology and then I started to meet all these other artists that were exploring the same medium. Um, he, um, and uh, Edward Bertinsky, he actually submitted a 3D printed artwork. Nicola Feldman, this artist that had been working with this, this, uh, this process for decades. And it was really great to, um, to see the process and the way that they've explored, explored uh, the same uh, medium. It is intergenerational. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Peggy. Well, my role, in fact, I started out, um, Francesca asked me if I could provide her with some addresses and emails, and that's how my role started, but it became more complex, and I ended up writing you know, one, of the essays, well, just one of the essays and so on. Um, so some of the people I suggested um, are here. And Andrew Owen, next in line here, I know that he has done all kinds of different sorts of things, including paintings not using paint and sculptures not taking up space and inventing media and inventing um, ways of looking and ways of making things. So Andrew, why did you choose this of all the things you might have chosen? I sort of anticipated a painting of flowers. I thought um, it would be nice to just have something quiet, very, very quiet, and the work is actually, uh, the value in the work comes from the absence of the image, because it were it just two passport photos, it wouldn't be as interesting as it, it, uh, as it being made by two passport photos that had, had, had faces removed. Was that in China? Uh, yes, from the, the visa office in, in Taipei. A uh, very uh, imposing looking building, and there's even an armed guard on either side of the door. And then you go inside, and there's a big waiting room for, with a hundred people uh, wailing humanity. I mean, there's everybody there babies crying, and uh, Buddhist monks, and uh, uh, Canadian English teachers, and everybody's there waiting to get a visa. And then they ask you to bring three passport photos, and then there's a, a whole a counter where they ask you, uh, there's actually these big, huge cast iron uh, photo punches and a little sign that says, please punch out your face. So you, oh my you, God. you, you stick, you stick the passport photo in there and you pull this big red knob like this, like a slot machine, you go chunk like this and it cuts out your face. And then you give them the three faces and then there's waste baskets full of these discarded passport images. So I collected about 2,000 of them over four years there. This is more typically how more typically how it would look, something like that. The gender and the nationality and the status have kind of been obliterated. Or but anything. it's about lost identity. Right, so I was thinking about, I didn't know why, why they were valuable at first, and then I, I realized that um, it, they kind of represent something when you leave one culture and migrate to another culture, you really do have to abandon your former uh, identity. I mean, you lose your friends, your family, your language. So this small little discarded passport photograph references something much, much larger and much more um, important than just a little photograph. So that was the idea, is uh, something large with, exhibited within the small. I think it's one of the most powerful pieces. Oh. Gee, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> The artwork itself is uh, tracing over and over the map of Toronto and then reshaping, um, reshaping that map. Toronto on the international scene is seen as a multicultural city often projecting a very peaceful and harmonious sort of feeling. Uh, yet there's once one arrives in the city sort of feels other tensions in it. And that one of it is the fact that it's placed on indigenous land. So I titled the work The Dreamcatcher Toronto Series, speaking of Toronto as a dreamcatcher series, uh, uh, Toronto as a dreamcatcher in many respects, where dreams sometimes turn into nightmares and other times they turn into happy endings. So 
the artwork has two sides, Black which and in a way are two sides of the same coin. Um, also, as my work lately has uh, has become a little more playful, so to speak, I decided that the inside of the artwork uh, was to be the place, this kind of liminal place where all the tension happens, where sort of if we were to conceptualize it and think that the, the dreams kind of float within the artwork, then it is the space in the center where everything meets. Okay. And within the center, Wonderful, which is huh? completely invisible to the eye, um, is where I've enclosed four semi-precious stones, which are red jasper, uh, yellow amber, black onyx, and white um, holite. So, um, in many respects, in the artwork, the center <coughs> is where everything meets. And yet, it is invisible. There has been a lot of thought going into each of these works, and it's sort of nice to be able to hear a little bit. I mean, you haven't got, well, you haven't got anything else when you hear that five, but you know, you get a little bit more. Some of the thinking behind what you can see, but can't really know. You have to think about it, but these are really very important uh, entrances. I would like to draw your attention to something that is a little bit on the same wavelength. This is a drawing by Douglas Cardinal. And I said, can you draw the Museum of History? So you don't see the Museum of History here. Okay. And yet, uh, it's here, because this is the atrium, and this is uh, all the inner elements. But he said that uh, while he was walking on the site before building, before designing actually the, the building, he was talking to his ancestors. And his ancestors uh, said, don't be afraid. The museum is already there. You only have to unconceal it. And so these are the inner lines of the inner energy. As Anne Michaels, the poet laureate of Toronto, recently wrote, a statement in their own hand, the size of a hand. This evening, we are here for the third collateral event of Great North. And uh, the topic tonight is photography in the third millennium. So to my surprise, it seems that instead of feeling confined, you were all inspired by the unusual microformat. So you actually defied the limitations and the flatness of the canvas by creating three-dimensional works. And most of you experimented with unexpected materials, from papier-mâché to gold leaf, from aluminum to sand. So let's start now with Edward Leptinsky. Um, if anybody's seen the show at the AGO, uh, I tend to work in very large images, so this was a hard concept to work in the kind of four by five inch format, which is more like a contact in, in, my, in, in my photography. But at first I was gonna say, well, my work really doesn't you know, fit into that format, but then is, has anybody ever tried saying no to Francesca? <laughs> uh, it doesn't work. Uh, so her persistence uh, got me to say, okay, okay, I'll, I'll do something. Um, and it was an interesting moment. It was because in the middle of the research of the Anthrop Anthropocene Project, we were looking at all the terminology that scientists were using uh, in terms of defining the fact that the humans have now entered uh, the period of the Anthropocene. And one of the big categories is extinction. And uh, I was trying to understand how I can kind of bring that idea forward through photography and using 3D as well. So I started looking at what would be an interesting object and one of the pieces of information that I discovered was that rhino horns were, uh, had seven times more value uh, by weight than gold. Uh, so a rhino horn is in, in, in the thousands and thousands of dollars. So I went to the raw and I said, can I actually get a rhino horn? 
they have dozens of them there, and I'm going to scan it, so I need it for a week or two, and I recreated the rhino horn at 100%. So it was, and within the 3D printing process, it was within two grams. And so when Francesca came, I thought, well, that rush, for that gold rush and, and the extinction of the rhinos is for this kind of mythological, I think it helped in the Chinese and Vietnamese medicine, uh, they believed that uh, it gave them more virility and also that it helped, helped them with hangovers. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm thinking they're running these animals, these magnificent animals, to extinction for this you know, uh, false belief that there is this medicinal purpose uh, of the rhino horn. So I got gold leaf, and then I you know, shrunk the rhino horn and suspended it in front as a piece uh, of this kind of idea that you know, humans are in search of wealth and uh, often find, you know, in a misdirected way, and this was, and it's also bringing animals to extinction. So that's kind of how I got to the piece. Right Thank here. you so much. Let's move now to Susie Lake. My work is uh, focused on representation, identity, and gender issues um, since the um, early 1970s. But pertaining to the work that I contributed to this exhibition, uh, I thought that it was really important that uh, uh, I, I choose a work that was significant of, of my own practice and um, yet also responded to the spirit and the parameters of the collective exhibition. Um, so I chose um, from a series called Profile, which was done in 2002 for several reasons. For one, it was a series that I really, really loved and that had several images that I had never printed and always intended to go back to it. Francesca gave me the opportunity to do so. And when this work was conceived, media and consumer culture was still supporting young, hot representations of women. This is 2002, which was before um, the succession of um, historic shows um, um, early feminist work. Uh, so feminism was still a dirty word at that point, <sighs> but I was moving past middle age. I have nothing to lose but create um, an image or a series of images that focused on ageism. I wanted the photograph to be a beautiful object so that it would invert the paced realization that the sitter, me, had a three month growth of facial hair. Anyway, the, the important thing for me was the, 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 the double reading that the piece has is the assumption of what it is when you first look at it. Such a formal, simple, profile portrait. And that as you get closer, you start to actually see an incredible length of facial hair. It's not just accidental facial hair. It is a length of facial hair. Um, and about six months after I did that project, I think that um, uh, Sarah Palin was crucified for her portrait on the cover of Newsweek magazine because they hadn't airbrushed out a piece of facial hair they showed. So for um, all that works feminist intent, it's a shame that nearly 50 years later, we still need to address the social and economic inhumanity of the Trump and Ford administration. Women have to be careful. We are again hearing pre-feminist language and demeaning references towards women. I usually work in series, not in singular images. And how am I going to do something that's both beautiful in terms of composition and colors, but also that has a a social justice resonance about it. And so it was a real challenge. And I, um, I tried a number of things, and then eventually one day, I happened, I happened to have uh, been traveling in Italy, in Calabria, in a small town called uh, Tropea, and walked into a small church. It's very dark and gloomy looking, but my eye really was immediately caught the sight of this um, uh, unusual statue of a young girl. She had her eyes half closed, half open. It was very haunting that way. She was in between life and death. So anyway, I, I took the photograph, and it turns out that uh, Philomena was a young girl who the, um, whom the emperor Diocletian in the third century AD wanted to marry. 
And so she resisted the attempts of this man to, um, to marry her. And um, he found her resistance and her defiance um, unbearable. Um, in the end, he beheaded her. After she, she was martyrized, she became a martyr, and she became a symbol. She became really the patron saint of youth. And she became, I think, for me, a symbol of, of um, this fe feminist side. You know, we often talk about, we talk in, about the um, murdered and missing indigenous women in Canada, thousands of them. But there are thousands of women who are murdered and, and missing also in other places. And, and I wanted, therefore, to make a statement and maybe create awareness um, about uh, f feminist side. And now, Rita. So my, my photograph, uh, just so you know, I actually have a second one of it here. Um, and it is a photograph of two uh, Sitka black-tailed deer. And they're hanging um, after having been killed. And they will be used for, for food and clothing uh, by, the, by people I met in Haida Gwaii when I was working there just about 10 years ago. And it's printed on aluminum using a hybrid technology that combines uh, a digital negative with palladium metal and it has sepia and cyan over top. And the resultant image has a longevity based on what we know about uh, pigment and precious metals and the arches paper from France that it's printed on of something like 700 years. And, and actually that was part of my, my thinking when I made this, when I made this object. Uh, it was October 2015 when uh, this commission came about. At the time I was touring my project uh, and exhibition looking for Marshall McLuhan in Afghanistan and had been thinking a lot about um, memory and historic permanence and impermanence and digital technology. And while so much of my work has been made outside of Canada, I wanted to do something uh, local. And I chose the Edward Curtis Project, which was a collaboration I did with an incredible First Nations playwright and filmmaker in Canada, despite how much I love what came out of it, this little tiny object, I immediately made an extremely high res scan of it and printed it huge. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Now, John Oswald. So, your lenticular 3D life size photograph entitled hand sand emerges from a base of wood covered in real sand. The idea of life size and photographing a lot of people and reproducing them life size. That's something that, yes, I have been uh, doing with almost everything that has to do with photography and reproducing it. When I was told about the parameters of the, the, the project, that the thing had to be this size, I thought, okay, I do like working with life size. So, uh, what do we have that we can do that's life size with a window like this? So, I just started checking that out. And of course, you know, there's, uh, oh, there's a <laughs> my, my version of the Susie Lake. If, if, if. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe your ear or your nose. Uh, there is a bit of misappropriation in, in I think, in any kind of photography. But, um, so, this is late. But what I eventually did, and this was you know, the other part besides the human body that's uh, in my photograph, is have a hand come out of the sand like this. So it is a three-dimensional thing. Uh, I was using sand partly because I don't make objects regularly. I'm not very good at building things. Uh, and I was thinking about how sand is incorporated in making a glass and that kind of have some kind of uh, glass in the thing I send the lens of the can and all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, the hand of the sand seemed like a nice thing that was, again, this size. So, that's what I did. Thank you.
Perfect. Now I give the platform to Mark Glassman, co-moderator, for the second round of questions, which are more specific to the medium of photography. Mark Glassman is a professor, as I said before, in documentary media uh, at Ryerson, but also a highly respected cultural expert, editor of POV magazine, and film critic at Classical 96.3 FM. The digital technology has, of course, affected <laughs> photography in many ways. Um, and I was wondering if everyone could think about that. And I wanted to specifically ask Rita because of her wonderful work uh, looking for Marshall McLuhan in Afghanistan, which deals a lot with this notion of digital technology and she has true awareness of analog photography. So Rita, how is digital technology impacting on photography? The short answer to that is enormously, of course. Um, but uh, I, from the outset, have, have really tried to have a positive uh, view of what digital technology is doing. Um, people often ask me about what I, I feel about the smartphone, and not, you know, not to be overly Pollyanna about it, it has clearly increased visual literacy in in uh, in unbelievable ways we never could have imagined before. And when people have said to me, you know, doesn't it make you crazy that anyone can take a picture? I think, well, wouldn't that be like an author saying, isn't it crazy that everyone can read and write now? Um, I mean, visual literacy is, uh, is obviously a good thing. Um, what we need more of is training in uh, critical, critically thinking about and looking at uh, photography just as we do with writing. I mean, I think critical thinking is, is the, probably the foremost uh, challenge we have, we have today. It's, it's funny because um, going digital now, I feel really, really comfortable with it, but when I was doing analog, um, a lot of the things that Photoshop was made to do, I was doing, um, such as multiple exposures, um, in 1974, I was printing images three feet by three feet. I was heating and stretching negatives. The decision to use these visual um, strategies is because it, it carries emotive or um, narrative content. I did go into digital kicking and screaming because I could do all of that, and I still love my Mamiya. Uh, <laughs> It was one of those cameras that if you didn't use it a, a lot, it was temperamental, and if you used it too much, it didn't, you know, it got temperamental as well. So this evening uh, is the fourth and the last collateral event of Great North. The topic is verbal, the verbal and the visual. The co-moderator is Peggy Gale, independent art curator and critic who greatly helped me and inspired me during my research. Let's give her and the artists a warm welcome. So my catalog text for Imago Mundi was titled, All Images Are Partial, suggesting that limiting barriers such as window views, photo edges, picture frames. But tonight's panel embodies the partial aspect even more, as varying media, painterly, sculptural, textural, are all present here. And the narratives underlying each artist's choices are all the more entwined and evocative. So coats of many colors. The first of our artists here tonight, Bill Burns, works in many media, sculpture and installation, like his safety gear for small animals but also performance, painting, and text. His text works include trailing slogans from airplanes, Ho Hanru, deliver us, and he has produced nine books to date. I expect that it was not a huge stretch for you to do something 10 by 12. What do you think? Yes, it wasn't a, a big stretch. Um, I, I made a picture uh, uh, which is a, um, uh, a simulation of a chalkboard, and um, so I used chalkboard paint and um, and uh, chalk as as kind of uh, in, with, mixed with matte medium to draw on it. And I drew the names of um, 
a list of people who have wronged me. Um, yeah. Now you have to say a little more about that. What is wronging in this case? Well, um, uh, Maria Lind is at the top of the list. Um, uh, uh, she invited me to an exhibition and also in the, uh, in the kind of uh, long and short of it, uh, we no longer communicate. Um, <laughs> and uh, who really threatened to sue me because I made a bobblehead doll of, uh, of him in his image. So I, uh, actually I had thought that this was just a jokey kind of list, but th this is all true. <laughs> well. <laughs> right? Yes, it, no, yeah. it's true, that they're all true. Um, um, but I think, uh, um, I don't really hold that. I think they're misdemeanors within our, like, uh, within the range, you know. Um, yeah, but they're a confessional all in they're, all, they're, all, they're all in print now. <laughs> That's where the work comes out of, but it also comes from just trying to understand my, our, you know, our relationship between myself as a worker in the arts and the kind of these relationships that we have. And so, um, Okay. Well, it's a complicated structure, as we all know. Mm. Yeah. Carlo Chester, as the Imago Mundi catalog points out, his work is concerned with the juxtaposition of ornamental elements against the concise structures and forms of modernism. His piece for Imago Mundi is titled Industrial English, Scopiare, to blow up, to blow up a digital print that closely resembles the embroidered name or title on a workman's overalls. I was doing research about uh, workers, uh, not so much cultural workers, just work, real workers, immigrant workers, and I came across, through my research, this uh, book called Industrial English, which had a great name. I thought, what's in Industrial English? Anyways, I tried to find the book. Of course, it was out of print, so I went to the Central Library I found the only copy, and I, cop and I photocopied every single page and brought it home. Um, and it was written by Carlo or Charles Katcha, who was, uh, was, I guess, he was an MP. Uh, maybe the first Italian Canadian MP? I'm not sure. He, he was in the Trudeau government. Anyways, he wrote the book, uh, a self published book, and it was a book, uh, I guess, a, a technical guide for recent immigrants uh, so that they could. Uh, how do you describe it? I think he described it from, uh, uh, from peasants or proletariat. The idea was that many of the immigrants that came at that period really had no experience with anything to do with industry and they were agrarian, mostly people from, from farms. So he wrote this book as a technical guide. When I found the book, um, <clears throat> like how many years later, uh, 50 years later or 30 years later, I was struck by how poetic it was and beautiful it was, and just, just the text itself. And the idea of language, and so I based a lot of work. A lot of work came out of those pieces. But still, you had an entire book to choose from, and you chose to blow up. Uh, when Francesca asked me to contribute something here, I just thought the word has some kind of further resonance right now in our in, in our in our times. So next we have Gary Michael Dalt. How did you choose <coughs> this the small photograph of a reclining nude, with its title apparently a, ver a variation on? Marcel Duchamp, why not sneeze, Rose, c'est la vie. When Francesca asked me to be a part of this uh, exhibition, I decided to do something that was, in fact, a kind of hands-off piece. I, I wanted it to be uh, as untouched by me as possible. Uh, it so happens that it, in uh, three or four years ago, I had an exhibition at the Anna Leon Owens Gallery in Halifax, um, which was a very large exhibition of very small pictures. They were. <clears throat> just very, very about the size of these canvases, and, and each image was a photograph that I had not made, but which I had simply harvested from the uh, vintage toy section of the eBay uh, world on, uh, online. Uh, when it came time to do this, uh, I just chose this enigmatic image of this woman floating in a kind of ether, uh, dreamlike ether. Um, she was floating in a background that I had not provided for in a photograph I had not taken. She seemed vulnerable and asleep and in some kind of trance state. So uh, for some reason I thought she was Rose Selavi, Duchamp's uh, uh, alter, female alter ego. Duchamp's title, as you say, was uh, Why Not Sneeze, Rose Selavi. And uh, 
sneezing seemed to have very little to do with it in the end. Uh, she seemed to be in a dream state. So the little work is called uh, Why Not Dream, Rosillaby. And so for me, she may be somnolent, sleepy, and in come some kind of transported state. We don't really have, want to hold up the experience. We can just let Rose go, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and now I think maybe we should proceed with uh, should. Leon Rook. Leon Rook is an American-born Toronto-based poet, writer, visual artist, and playwright. Your painting is a little bit like your short stories, showing only a fragment and letting the viewer, the reader, complete the picture. A kind of opera aperta, Umberto Eco would say. Tell us what you were thinking when you painted the half of the face. I happen to remember that this man Callahan, for, for a long time, had a large painting in his sitting room done by a Japanese painter, a huge painting. And, and uh, Barry's face occupied the entire huge painting. So I thought, ha, huh. so that image had stuck with me over the years, and I think, okay, that's what I'll do with this little thing. <laughs> and the title, I've seen the glory and... I see the glory and... It's not, obviously looking at nothing specific, and I've noticed that that is an expression frequently to be found on the faces of certain people uh, when God has spoken to them, or they have, the word has been delivered, and they indeed have seen the glory. Oh, da, da, da. That's wonderful. And now, Barry Callahan, how did you come up with the idea of incorporating an objet trouvé? Uh, I didn't come up with the idea. It, um, it, it came up with me. I was watching a, a Raptors basketball game, and I end up doing a lot of things watching basketball games, and that's when I do it. And um, I remembered I had this horse. Now, horses have played a large part in my life because I like to gamble, and um, I played the horses from about 1982 till very recently, almost every day, every week. So I have these little horses sitting around from Saratoga. I brought them home from a supper, and I thought, what the hell, I'll stick a horse in this. Um, once it was done, I thought, gee, that's kind of interesting. Thank you. And now Francesca Di Venza. She's a mixed media artist and author. Her practice includes artist books and site-specific installations, which she calls tentative itinerary. Uh, my work uh, is um, a, a work on paper in the format of uh, a book and uh, the paper I used was actually were maps, geological maps and uh, I used... Maps of Canada? Um, yes, these are maps of Canada and in the title there is the box, Pandora's box, but it's a box and this is a, a book format so both of them have a cover and you have to open the cover to, to see what is inside. So um, I suddenly thought, you know, well, why is the box in English? Because in Italian, as you know, it's a vaso, which is a vase. So I went to, to uh, do a bit of a research on this, on this uh, word, and I think it's a, a quite interesting, actually. So what I, said, what I find out is that, what I found out is that uh, uh, Erasmus of Rotterdam in the 16th century was that, as far as we know, that we find out, is that the first one who, uh, the first person, the first scholar, who translated from ancient Greek to Latin. And uh, so he translated uh, the word for jar in English that was actually pithos into Latin uh, pixis. I guess maybe the similarity the sound. But pixis in Latin is box. And so box remained. And so I came out with this idea that the Greeks at the time, you know, 800 uh, uh, BC, uh, colonizing the southern part of Italy and Sicily. So uh, that maybe uh, the Pandora's legend uh, uh, sort of uh, became uh, spoken into, went directly 
into the local language, it may be from uh, uh, Greek to Latin, or maybe via local populations into Latin, without any official translation written. So last but not the least, Reinhard Reisenstein. Francesca asked me to do this, uh, and I thought it was kind of fun, because at the time I was making a lot of small six-inch drawings where I was chronicling the entire Carolinian species, which are some 70 uh, kinds of trees. And it's kind of like a, um, a taxonomy of the, of the, the conifers of Canada, of the, the Carolinian forest, the Tega region, and I've also done a, a taxonomy of the, the conifers of the US. And there, I was working at a really small scale using tiny, tiny pens, and, and I just continued that by uh, taking a sample out of the, one of the Canadian conifers and drawing in there the roots. It's kind of like the whole creature. And it, you know, it's basically curiosity that drove me to do that, and also to, to reveal the things that we generally don't pay much attention to. And yet we now know, as research goes forward, that the, the complexity of the, of the communication below the ground uh, is quite extensive and quite uh, multi-leveled and quite significant to our well-being. And um, I think ultimately we deal with uh, the fact that we are able to breathe by virtue of the health of the trees. So that's where that comes from. That's about it. I'm not much more complicated than that. Good. Thank you, all of you, for coming. And please linger and talk to the artists, see the artworks, the books that they brought, because this was the whole idea. Thank you so much. I think I, everyone will agree that uh, this project uh, um, in Mago Mundi uh, is a great experience all brought to you through the real creativity <laughs> and, and the stick-to-itiveness of uh, Francesco Valente. So thank, thank you. you to Bertens. Thank you.